Hello, and welcome to this webinar on using the built-in SQL database with SPIN 1.4. Today, we're going to take a look at this new feature in the latest version of SPIN. I am Melissa Klein, the Open Source Program Manager at Fermion. I'm going to start the webinar off with a quick introduction to SPIN and the built-in SQL database feature. Later, I will be joined with, by Ryan Levick, a principal engineer at Fermion, and he will be doing the demo in the second half of this webinar. So let's get started. First, what is SPIN? SPIN is an open source framework for building and running event-driven microservices with WebAssembly. The first release of SPIN was in spring of 2020. This past spring, we hit an important milestone with the 1.0 release. Since that release in March, we've done monthly releases with the current release of SPIN at 1.4 in July. SPIN is, at, is open source and built on open standards. So you can take your SPIN applications and run them almost anywhere. There are SPIN implementations for local development, for self-hosted servers, for Kubernetes and for cloud hosted services. SPIN aims to be an awesome developer experience. It is a single binary tool to create, build and run your applications. SPIN comes with built in templates and requires no bo boilerplate. So it is fast and easy to get started writing the logic of your applications. There are SDKs from multiple languages, including Rust, Go, Python, JavaScript, and TypeScript. So let's take a step back and talk about WebAssembly or WASM for short. WASM is a W3C standard binary format for a stacked-based virtual machine, which makes it both cross-platform and cross-architecture. You may be thinking, I know WebAssembly as a browser-based technology, why would I build microservices with it? Well, Wasm is sandboxed, portable, and fast with millisecond cold start times. These characteristics make it appealing for other use cases, such as mobile and edge devices and serverless applications. Additionally, because it is an open standard, many languages have added Wasm implementations which means you can get started with WASM without learning a new language. Now let's take a look at how easy it is to get an app up and running with SPIN. After installing SPIN, we start by running the SPIN new command. This command gives you a list of templates. Pick one that matches your application type and language. Here I picked an HTTP request handler using Python going to give the app a name, in this case, PyTest, and to accept the fault for the other options. Okay, so now there's a directory with my new app in it. So I'm going to change to the PyTest directory, and I see there's an app.py and a spin.toml file in this directory. I'm going to edit the app.py file, and I see I already have a basic HTTP request handler. I'm going to make a little, a few quick changes to this just to make it my own. And once I do that, I'm going to save this file and go back to the command line. Now we're ready to build. So we do a spin build command and it builds the application. Next, spin up, we'll start the application running. And we can see that it's running at port 3000. So I go over to another terminal window and I'm going to curl to that address. And now I see that I got my ex ex expected result. And there, that's how you run, uh, get started running a spin application. So as you can see, it is easy to get started with SPIN. There are many more features you can use to build a SPIN app. You can check out our documentation to learn more about those features. 
But now let's talk about accessing, accessing data sources from a SPIN application. Even before our 1.0 release, SPIN had support for bringing your own database. With this feature, you can host and manage a data store outside of SPIN and use a SPIN API to make outbound calls to it. There is support for relational databases such as MySQL and Postgres, and an also support for Redis data stores. This is useful when you have existing data you want to access with your new application. You can find an extensive example of how to use this feature in the example directory of the SPIN repo. Next, SPIN 1.0 introduced a built-in key value data store. This means there's no ops required for all the provisioning, configuration, and management is done by SPIN. Components are not given access to the KV store by default. They must be granted access. To do this, you simply add one line to your application manifest file. Then you can access the key value store from the component of your application using the API. For examples on how to use this feature, you can see the examples database, excuse me, the examples folder in the spin repo or in the language SDKs. So now if you want an SQL database, but you don't want to host your own, with spin 1.4, we now have a built-in SQLite database. Again, no ops are required. SPIN is going to create, configure, and manage the SQL database for you. Components do not have access to the database by default. Only one line needs to be added to the application manifest file to grant access to the components. And there's no credentials or connection strings to be managed. SPIN handles all the communications securely. To get started, using the SQLite database feature. First, you want to make sure you have SPIN 1.4 or later installed. You also want to make sure that you're up to date with the latest versions of your language SDKs you wish to use. Then we're going to go through the SPIN new and with your desired template, start your application. And then in the spin.toml file, the application manifest, you're going to add this SQLite databases equals default. This will give access to the default database to any components that you wish to give access to. And that's it. SPIN will create the database for you. And then you can access it from your code. Here you see an example Python file. Here you see it's using the SPIN SQLite uh, module to access the database, Does, opens a connection to the default database, it runs an SQL statement and returns a result, and then returns the, with an HTTP request handler, returns that result to the user. All of the language SDKs are using a common set of operations for interacting with the SQL database. Open, execute, and close. The open and close operations open and close a connection to the database. The execute operation will execute an SQL statement. So for a more in-depth explanation of how to use these operations and how to use them with your preferred language, you can see the SQL storage API guide in the spin documentation. So spin start a brand new database for you, but that that does, database does not include any tables. So you can write code to run SQL statements that will create the tables that you want, or with your spin up command, you can use the SQL light option to either run a file to set up the database or you can run the, the SQLite option with, it, with SQL commands. You can also use the runtime configuration file or the runtime config.toml file to add additional 
SQLite databases, each with their own name. So if you reference just default, you'll get a default database, but then you can add additional ones with different names in different locations. You can also specify what location you want the default database to be. It will, if nothing is specified, it will save it in the docs bin directory. But if you want to save it or reference an existing database, you can set it in the runtime configuration file. Okay, so now it's time for a demo. I'd like to pass it off to Ryan Levick for, to do the demo. All right, everybody, are you ready to build a to-do application using Spin and SQLite? Let's do it. So I've already created a little bit of our Spin to-do workspace here with a bit of the boilerplate already created for us so that we don't have to do that. But let's take a look at what we already have here. So I'm going to run tree um, with git ignore flag here in order to show what we already have. So we have a couple of things here that are probably familiar with uh, to you if you've done any spin uh, development before or if you're a Rust developer. But let's take a look what that looks like. So we have a spin.toml manifest file here, and that describes what our spin application looks like. We'll take a look at that in just a second. We also have a cargo.toml file. That's a manifest file for our Rust application that we're building. Um, and we have a source directory here that has lib.rs inside of it. And that's where the code that we'll be working on today. And lastly, we have a static assets file here. This is all of the front end code that we're going to need in order to run our, our application. I went ahead and did that ahead of time so that we don't have to worry about building the front end um, for us as, as we go. All right. Um, so let's take a look at the spin.toml file um, in order to know what our spin application actually looks like. So here's what that looks like, and it should be familiar to you if you've seen a spin uh, manifest uh, file before, but if not, don't worry. Um, it includes some metadata about our application here, including a description, um, the authors of the, uh, of the application name, and this is an important part here, the trigger. So what actually triggers our application to run, and this says that HTTP requests are what triggers it. We have other types of triggers um, in spin as well. And this application is composed of two components. One is the to-do API component, and that's what we're going to be working on today. That's the API for our application. And the second one is a file server that serves all of the static assets that we have over here in our static assets file. So including our index.html, CSS, um, favicons, um, app.js as well. And what we specify right here with our component trigger is anything any request that comes in to slash api slash anything will be served by this component right here our api component and otherwise we kind of have the fallback route of slash anything will be served by our static file server instead all right so then we can take a look at what our code actually looks like so far. And if you jump over here, you'll see that in fact, we're, we're just dealing with this spin sort of uh, hello world um, or hello fermion um, example that we have that you create when, whenever you have a default application. So this is what we're gonna be replacing with our API logic instead. All right, so let's go ahead and, and give this a run. We can do that by doing spin build here that builds our application. Um, and, and then once we've built our application, we can run spin up and that brings up our application here. So our application is up and uh, it's getting up and running here and now it's running on localhost port 3000. And you can see that for slash API will be serving the API um, component and for anything else, the file server will be serving it. So let's take a look at what this looks like in practice. Here is our, our to-do application front end already running. Um, looks great. Um, but if we try and add a to-do, like do laundry, or, or laundry uh, instead, it doesn't work. Like it's not working um, here. And so let's take a look and see what's happening over here. We'll bump over here and we'll see, oh, we're running into the fact that that hello fermion that we're returning from our API is not valid JSON and certainly not the JSON or any re uh, response that our to-do application um, is expecting. So this is an expected error. We wanna go ahead and actually return back something that our application um, can, can actually work with. All right, so let's return back to our code here. Um, we'll go ahead and, and comment this out here. Um, and the first thing that we're gonna wanna do is actually connect to, to our SQLite database so that we can actually um, query for, for data inside of it. So in order to do that, we're going to use this connection type that you can see right here comes from the SPIN SDK SQLite module. 
if we go ahead and bring that in, we can use open or rather open default here to open the default database for our uh, application. Every spin application um, comes by default with a default database that we can use um, where we don't really have to configure very much in order to use it. If we have more databases, then we can use the open method in order to open those databases by whatever name we decide to give them. So we're opening our, our database here, and if it fails, we'll go ahead and re return back that error. Um, and once we have a connection here, then there's only really one thing we can do with it, and that's calling the execute uh, method on it. So we can pass in some kind of uh, SQL statement here in order to be executed. Um, and in order to do that, what we can do is, uh, let's just run select star from to-dos, from some to-dos table. And we have to pass in some parameters here, um, but we don't have any, so we'll just return an empty list. That's if you wanna interpolate in um, some parameters um, and doing that in a way that's uh, safe from uh, SQL injection. Um, and that can also fail, so we'll question mark that up as well here. And that will run our, um, uh, our uh, query that we have here, and we'll turn back a result. So we'll do, um, we'll call that to-dos here. And you'll see here that Rust Analyzer is, is printing out that um, to-dos is of type query result. So it returns back some object called query result that we can get the rows of our query from and, and, and the columns from our query. And of course, we're still complaining that we have to return a response here. So let's, let's uncomment this again and at least return something here. But we'll go ahead in the meantime and print out the to-dos that we have. So to-dos like this. And in fact, I'll go ahead and print it out using that. So we'll see nice verbose output um, as well. All right, so let's go ahead and run this. Um, go in here, we'll run spin build, and then we'll do the dash u option that does spin build and then spin up um, all in one go. Um, so we're just getting a warning that we're not using this request uh, object here, that's fine. And now our application is being served on port 3000 again. We'll hop over to our front end um, and we'll see that we're getting a 500 here. Uh-oh, so what's happening here? Well, we can see by the error message right here that we have access denied. So we're not being allowed access to our default database. What, what's up with that? Well, it turns out by default, um, default databases or any database is not allowed, or any application is not allowed to access a database unless it is explicitly allowed to do so. And we do that inside of our spin.toml file by coming in here, finding the component that we want to give access to, which is our API component in this case, and saying that the SQLite databases that it has access to are equal to um, the default database. So now our component will have access to the default database. So let's go ahead and try running that again. And you can see down here that we're actually accessing our, our default uh, database as well. Okay, well, let's head over here and refresh. And you'll see, okay, we're still getting a 500. That's not good, but it's a different error. And if we head over to um, our, our terminal here, we'll see that the error that we're actually running into is that we do not have a table called to-dos. So we need our database, which is completely empty now, to have some kind of schema, and it's expecting to have the tables, uh, the table called to-dos, and we're gonna have to create that. So how do we do that? Well, um, we can take advantage of a flag on spin up called SQLite. And if we pass, we can pass SQLite uh, flag here, a string to execute or even a file of, of SQL to, to go ahead and execute. We'll do that. We can specify a file by doing this at sign here and then doing the name of the file and we'll, we'll call it migration.sql. If we run this, we'll see it, it errors out because it doesn't know what migration.sql is. So let's go ahead and create that migration.sql. All right, we've created our migration.sql file here. Um, and we'll have to populate this with some SQL that we want to run. I'm gonna come over to the off screen here and copy some SQL that I have uh, over here. And in fact, I'll, I'll even simplify it a bit by just doing two, uh, two fields here. 
So this SQL is pretty simple. It just creates a table, if it doesn't exist, called to-dos, has an ID that's an auto-incrementing primary key, and a description that's text that can't be null. So pretty straightforward. Um, and if we come back here and try and run this again, um, oh, seems like we have a uh, an error because I left a comma there when I shouldn't. C SQL is very fickle. That's why I um, copied it, and, and then I went ahead and, and edited it anyway. Oh, oh well, uh, I guess I'll learn next time. So we see here, now it's working because I fixed our, uh, our error. It's, it's up and running, um, and now we should have a, um, a table called to-dos. So if we come back here, um, we'll see we're back to the original error that we had before where um, we're returning back hello fermion and it's not valid JSON like our, um, like our app expects. All right, but we're now printing out the um, query result that we have, and you can see that we have two columns, ID and description, um, and no rows, so no rows of data here. So that's great, we're making some progress here. So now inside of our app, what we have to do is somehow convert the result that we're getting back from, um, from our query and turn it into an HTTP uh, result, um, a response that we can re return back to the client. All right. So in order to, to do this, I think it's better if we if we have some data to work with. And in fact, um, we can actually manipulate our database directly if we want to, because all it is is a SQLite database that exists in our .spin file over here. And if you're not familiar with .spin, it just is a file where we stick some stuff that's um, of interest to you, like logs and your default database. So we can use SQLite, let me clear the screen here. And we can use SQLite 3 here to access our, our database in here. Um, and um, we'll go ahead and run insert into um, to do's. Um, and I hope I remember the, uh, um, the incantation correctly. So insert into to, to do's um, description. description description and then values um, do laundry all right and if we go ahead and run select star from to do's now now we have one uh, to do in our um, to do's table called do laundry um, and let's go ahead and verify that our app sees the same thing as well by running spin up and coming over here, refreshing the page. There we go. Getting the same error, but you can see now that we actually are getting data returned back to us. So awesome, we're, we're, we're almost done, we're almost on our way. So now we need to convert this query result into to a response that we can return back to the um, uh, to our uh, front end. So we need to go ahead and do to do's and we can call the rows function on it in order to get an iterator of rows. Um, and we'll just map over those rows here like this. Um, and we can call uh, let id equals r dot get. And we can pass in the name of the column that we have. Um, it's called ID. And description is called description. All right. Now, of course, these things might not exist. There's no way to statically know that these things exist. So we're going to have to handle the, the optionality of it. And for now, because this is a demo, I'm going to go ahead and use unwrap. But of course, you would want to handle that a little bit more elegantly in real life. Um, here. And the last thing that it's complaining about is that it needs some specific type um, in order to convert into. So we'll automatically cast um, our uh, the real result into what we expect. For ID, we'll do U32. And for description, we'll do a string of some sort. Um, and then we're going to take that data and turn it into something that we can serialize as, as JSON. So I'm going to create a struct called to do here. And it's going to have an ID of type U32 and a description of type string. And we're going to use our good old friend, Serde, in order to um, actually uh, convert this into JSON. So Serde 
um, serialize. We're going to have to bring in Serde as a um, dependency in Rust. So Serde, and it's going to be version 1.0, um, and it's going to use the feature of derive in order to be able to derive um, our deserialization. Our serialization. So that brings in Serde now. This is all looking happy. Um, oh, and what is it complaining about here? Um, it is not liking that. I'm not quite sure why that would be. Let's just real quick build this, figure that out. And in the meantime, what we're going to do is um, convert this into a to-do. Um, and of course, we're going to have to change our description, which is a string slice, into an owned string. I like to run to owned on it in order to do that. Um, let's see. Um, so for some reason, uh, it's not playing well with me and I'm sure uh, people at home are, uh, sure why this isn't working, but that's fine. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and instead we'll pull in sort of JSON, um, in order to do this. All right. So we're bringing in sort of JSON here. Um, and we're going to take our to-do here and convert it into, uh, into JSON. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So the first thing we do is collect into a vec here. So we have all of our to-dos here. Um, and now what we have to do is convert this into a uh, JSON that um, uh, that we can return back to the to the user. So we'll say let JSON equals, and um, we will convert our to dos into a JSON object of some sort. Uh, so sort of JSON, and we can use the JSON macro here in order to do this. Um, so we can say ID is equal to t.id and description, description, I got to learn how to spell description is equal to t.description here. All right. And we're just going to collect that into a vector. Um, and then we should be able to turn this into a body. Um, and it's complaining here uh, that it doesn't know how to turn this into um, a, a vector. That's fine. Um, we can say JSON dot, um, uh, serde JSON serialize, I'm sorry, to string. We'll turn our JSON into a string here, um, and then turn that into the bytes that we need. Oh, and of course we need to unwrap in case that our turning into string fails. All right, so we should be good here. Um, sorry about the sort of serialized. I'm sure after this I'll hit myself on the head for why that actually happened, but we have something turned into JSON here. We're gonna return it back to the user um, as well. So let's try and run this by running spin, oh, let me clear the screen for us, spin, build, and then dash U. And that's uh, taking in the, the new dependencies there, building them, um, and we're up and running and we can 
go ahead and there we go we have do laundry then so we are up and running we have everything running so just to repeat back what we got uh got going here is we started with not having a database we went into our spin uh, dot toml file here and allowed the usage of a database um, by using this line then inside of our code here what we were able to do is connect to the default database make a query to that database gets back some data, convert it into a model of some sort, turn that model into JSON um, in a roundabout way, sorry about that again, and then return it back to the user. And the front end knows how to take that and uh, actually display it to the user in the UI. So if you found this interesting and like to keep going, um, you can go to this uh, example demonstration here um, where we have this whole application written out with the ability to edit and to delete. Um, and you can run this um, in your uh, locally as well and try and um, uh, build out the rest of the application for your, for your own self. So I hope you enjoy this. Um, thank you very much.